the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Our gospel text for this morning is a rather interesting one when we look at that last bit that I just read. Come, let us kill the Son so that we may have His inheritance. Every time I sit down with this passage, I wonder how is that supposed to work? Surely if they kill the Son, the Father's not going to be inclined to give them. What is the Son's? It doesn't make sense to me when I read it. Until you actually look at the reverse of what happens. And we'll get there in just a second. But first, let's look at, let's take a step back and look at the vineyard itself, the world itself, that tenants are given into the vineyard. The father, the man who planted this vineyard sent the tenants into the world or into the vineyard so that they could care for God's, the Father's, good creation or divine master. So that they, it was given unto these tenants for them to make sure that, that the grapes grow properly, healthily, that the soil was good, and that when finally the fruit was brought to its ripest, it was to be turned into wine. And these tenants took care of it, for they believed it was their own. They worked the soil. They labored hard. They were the ones who cared and loved the grapes. Who was the master of the vineyard to tell them to hand over what they had worked so hard to produce? Who, do they, who, did, they, who did he think that he was? It's not fair. It's not fair that they should toil in the vineyard and make sure that the soul is fertile. It's not fair that they should pinch the grape to see just when it's ripe or check whether it is green or whether it is red or around here whether it is scopernong or muscadine. It's not fair that we should have to work and then give it over to the guy just because he owns the property and pays us the little wage. Dear Christian friends, that's also how we look at God. What is fair and what is not fair doesn't mean a thing when it comes to God. Is it fair that we should be here in this life digging soil to lay our loved ones in? Is it right that we should be in this vineyard working so hard to plant the seed of truth into people only to be frustrated when we don't get the, the attendance that we might like or if we don't fill the church the way that we would like or if we don't get the help that we need, if we don't get the deacons, if we don't get the elders, if we don't get the communion assistants. We work so hard. We work so hard to get a good result to get a ripe harvest. We are tenants, as were the Jews during the time of Christ. If you just worked hard enough at the law, you could be saved. If you only worked 
hard enough if you were only perfect. That's all you got to be. Perfect. All is well. And so, oh, by the way, I do believe in the Garden of Eden after the fall, God said to Adam that it would be by the sweat of his brow that he would tend the soil and that it would be by the pain that women would give birth. See, it's due to sin. The Jews of Christ's day did believe that they could keep the law. I'm sure Adam and Eve did too. Pre-fall, they did. And once they fell, they fell hard. And we fell with them. And the very next thing we know, murder. Just like that. It shows you what we tenants can do in the vineyard of God. We work so hard and it doesn't seem like God gives us our just rewards. Recently in the, in the past week, past two weeks, I have felt this pang in, in my heart regarding a, a friend of mine who is dying of cancer and so a lot of questions have been coming up as to why. What's the purpose? Such a lovely girl, full of life, and to see her wasting away is not only heartbreaking, but has, bring, has brought up questions, hard ones. It's not fair that she should have cancer and that she should die for she has worked in the vineyard so hard. She has worked in the vineyard so long and soon we'll work the soil to lay her to rest. But see, we only see those things through selfish eyes. Because the Jews who believed that they could keep the law were actually the tenants who would eventually find the Son come to them. The master of the vineyard would send the son saying, Surely the son, they will respect my son. He goes on my behalf. Surely they will respect him. And they say, Let us kill him. And so Christ dies. The son in whom God the Father has sent, the Jews and we by our sin, crucified until dead. What was that that we were saying about fair? Forget that. What's fair got to do with it? As I've said many times, God is not a fair God. Thanks be to God. We don't get what we deserve. We get grace, mercy, and peace. We get to be laid to rest whether we live or die. We find that rest. Surely they will respect my son. This is the heir. The heir of grace. The heir of everlasting life. The heir of all good things. This is the one who comes, who will reap the rewards of the vineyard. Come, I know what we can do. Let's kill him. And then his, what is his will be ours. Let's get back to that reverse though. It's not that if they kill him, they will steal the inheritance from him. But rather, it is because of Christ's death that we become heirs of everlasting life. And that's what's, that's what's so fantastic about this 
peace. So this scripture. They took, the, they took the tenant and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. And then when the father heard, he said that he would put those miserable wretches to death. And then as we go on through our scripture, we find that it was the Jews who rejected the cornerstone in which everything was built. And thus Christ was given over unto death, not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. Not only for the Jew, but also for each and every one of you. And you find that here. There is your, is your, uh, is your washing pool. There is your vineyard. There is where you come and receive the merits of Christ's death and resurrection. Eat and drink, taste and see that the Lord is good. Do not reject the cornerstone, lest you be crushed like the Pharisees. When Augustana burned down, and I can't speak to the pain because I was not here, but I can speak to the cornerstone that's right outside of this church that is marked. That cornerstone, and please look at it as you leave. Just as you come by and you touch the font or you look at the font, remember your baptism on the way to Lord's Supper. As you leave, look at that cornerstone. That cornerstone represents Christ upon what all the other bricks rely on. And the mortar are His sacraments. Christ Jesus alone was the one heir to whom they killed. Excuse me. We killed. Yet death could not hold Him. And death, therefore, cannot hold you or them or all of those who repent and who rest in the Lord's grace whether living or dead. That's the pure joy. That's where the law hits the gospel and we understand that we have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God and yet Christ Jesus Himself says, I forgive you. I stood right there and I spoke His words to you. In His stead and by His authority, I therefore forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Guess what? All of the sins that, that, brought, that you brought here today are wiped clean because the heir has died and has risen. Wiped clean. Do you deserve that? But God didn't ask you what you deserved. He simply gave His Son. John 3, 16 and 17. That He would not condemn the world. He would bring the world unto Himself. The Son of Man would be lifted up from the earth to draw all men to Himself. Oh, you who are baptized, who believe, who will walk by the font, who will commune, who will eat the body of Christ and drink His blood, have been drawn to Him by grace, through faith. You are the heirs. Amen.